Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Tonse. Uh, my name is Jennifer Ward, or you can call me Jen. Um, I am an educational developer with an Indigenous focus at the Centre for Teaching and Learning. Um, I also want to do just a little brief introduction of um, Elena. Elena is new to our team and she's going to be helping us um, with the EDI portfolio moving forward. Um, you may not see her on the screen because I don't think she's going to show her uh, face right now. Um, but welcome, Elena. I'm so happy to have you as a part of our team. And so today what we're going to um, talk about is creating an engaged learning environment while remaining equitable, diverse, and inclusive. You might have noticed at the beginning of the day, if you were here in the morning, that um, Graham was nice enough to include in our video our territorial acknowledgement. And so most of you have seen this, or maybe you already use this in your work and in your courses. Maybe this is something you do at the beginning of your semester. Um, and if so, I hope you continue to do that as we move um, into the online atmosphere. If you put the territorial acknowledgement on your e-class page, that is wonderful as well. But I always like to share what this territorial territorial acknowledgement actually means to me. So um, for some of you that know me, you know that I'm actually not from a Miskwichiwa Skygun or Edmonton. I am from Vancouver and my family is actually from the state of Oregon. So I'm from the Umpqua Nation. And so coming here to Alberta and to Edmonton, um, I am a guest on this territory. And even though um, I've been welcomed into the Treaty 8 um, family, so my husband is Treaty 8, but I also have been um, adopted by um, an elder named Gilman Cardinal. And so I still consider myself a guest. So for me, what I need to do as a guest in this territory is to always share what it means to me. So I always wanna honor um, diverse nations that call Treaty 6 home. I always want to acknowledge the medicines, the languages, the teachings, and the traditions of this territory. So I hope that some of you will be able to also make the territorial acknowledgement personal in some capacity. And we saw Tommy do that this morning in his keynote address as well. And so of course, this is a Miskwichiwa Sky Gun. And so by the end of this session, so we're going to develop a reciprocal teaching and learning mindset. We're going to demonstrate equity, diversity, inclusivity in teaching and learning. And we're going to discuss racism in the classroom. And so um, I was very fortunate to work with um, Dr. Catherine Van Kessel and um, my colleague, uh, Ellen Watson, as we discussed racism in the classroom. So we did a podcast and then Kintara Ingram, who's a PhD student and also a session instructor in the Faculty of Education, joined us and we did a session um, back in June. And so I think further discussions moving forward will be uh, for us to continue to address um, the issues that pop up in the classroom. So for today, um, I always like to ground myself in uh, my own teachings, um, the teachings and the knowledge that has been given to me by the elders and knowledge keepers. So one thing is Wakotuan. And so Wakotuan is a Cree word. It's more of a concept um, around kinship, relational accountability, reciprocity, and reciprocal learning. So um, we are in uh, kinship with one another um, as we form our learning communities. We have accountability to one another. Um, and so in that, we're holding each other accountable, but we're also creating safe spaces for each other to share our knowledge, to, sit, to share our learnings, and to learn in an equitable, diverse, and inclusive manner. And so how are we being uh, reciprocal? And so this morning in Tommy's keynote, if you attended, um, I chatted a little bit about um, uh, Dr. Walkimmer's um, notion of reciprocity and if you haven't had an opportunity i'll just show you sorry i'm going to reach to my book this book is so good it's called braiding sweetgrass um and she talks a lot about the, the reciprocal uh nature in, in in the environment um and how that actually is something that was taught to 
um, Indigenous nations by plants and animals and our other non-human kin, kin. And so we should always learn from one another. And I know many of you likely learn um, tons from your students. I know I do when I teach, and that's actually one of the, the very best parts of being in a classroom uh, with learners is learning from one another. So this is an I am from poem. And so what I'd like you to do is just create one line. You don't have to create a whole poem. But what I'll do is I'll share my poem with you and then I'll give you some instructions. So I am from homemade pies, baked bread, math is difficult, and Jennifer talks too much in class. I am from don't cry over spilt milk and every ABBA song. I am from pit houses and cherry blossom trees. I'd like you to choose um, one of these examples uh, to write your own stat or your own line of your poem. So choose a food that you ate growing up. Choose a memory from school, and it could even be from a post-secondary experience. Choose something that you heard an adult say when you were a child, and also um, maybe some music you heard in your home. And you could choose anything else that, you, that you'd like to share. So I'd like you to start it with I am from. And the reason why I do this is to try and create community in our classrooms. So when we know more about each other, we create uh, more in-depth and meaningful relationships with one another. So the reason why I do this um, is because I want to create that community. I want to give students a chance to get to know one another, but also to get to know me. Because, you know, part of the process of creating an engaged environment is just that, is allowing the students into your life just a little bit. So I'm going to um, read this, uh, I'll let you read this quote yourself, but really um, what uh, Hinging Garoa Smith, so um, he is Maori, and this is from the book Unsettling the Settler Within. So um, in essence, what uh, Graham is saying here is that um, we often create, just through our exclusion of managing um, racism or racist ideology or um, environments of inequity, we end up creating this intolerance. We were we're refusing to address things because we're personally uncomfortable rather than addressing them head on. And I think that sometimes that's what we need to do. We might have to take a pause and a breath and think about the best way to do that. But we really need to address these issues in our classrooms because they exist. And we have seen these in the online environment happen um, because people feel anonymous behind their computers. Right, so people feel like they can say anything, but the reality is, is we still have to create um, this uh, safe space for everyone. So EDI and course design. So learning outcomes, assessment, content, support, inclusion for all. So looking at our, our syllabi and, and looking like, is everything that's in there um, from an ableist perspective. What about student accessibility? Can students um, access the content in a good way? Or are students maybe having issues with their own internet? And we saw that this morning with Tommy. Like, what happens if your internet goes down and you can't watch a video and it's a video lecture? Do we have notes to accompany that so that the store slides that we can share with students so that they can watch that themselves? Um, doing synchronous versus asynchronous. So why are the reasons that we're choosing either? Um, I'm not gonna tell you here what you should choose. I just know that um, I'm not gonna add to the stress of our students um, by having them come meet me you know, twice a week uh, for the 13 or 14 weeks of class. Um, so are there opportunities for co-learning? Is this syllabus uh, flexible? Do you have opportunities for students to say, you know what, I'd really like to read this as a part of this curriculum? Is it co-created? So some neat things that I like to do is I like to give students the choice of how they're going to do their final presentation or their final project. So they get to choose the modality. 
maybe they want to do it in a video. Maybe they want to create a website. Uh, does the content that I'm choosing uh, for the students to read, are, is it biased? Are there stereotypes? Um, is it just from one, indivi one uh, individual's perspective? Um, are they all, you know, for a course that I teach, the majority of uh, the content is Indigenous. So it's all from Indigenous authors. So I prefer to privilege Indigenous voices in an Indigenous course. However, having said that, I actually also include non-Indigenous folks' perspectives as well. And so I think that there's some validity in that, and then that's a good way to ensure that there's um, equity, diversity, and inclusivity in the course. The other thing that I like to do is I like to include queer authors. So I talk about sexuality because um, for many Indigenous nations, gender, there's not just male and female. So the Cree, as an example, have five or six different um, viewpoints on gender. So I want to include those perspectives in my syllabus. And then looking at our LMS system. So our learning management system, so E-Class as an example. And so I took this tool, actually this WAVE tool, and I have the link here on my slide. Um, I'm gonna have a handout for everybody later. It'll come in about the next week and it'll be on our website that'll have all of this on there for you. So this WAVE tool, once you um, download it and then it looks at everything you're looking at on the net. So I took it and applied it to my eClass site. Well, what I found out is that it's very hard for people who have um, color blindness to actually view eClass properly. The green and the gold is actually not the greatest for people that have uh, visual acuity issues. And so um, that had me reflect on, you know, our LMS system, but also what are the resources that I'm using and would those resources um, be hard for students to see? Would there be an issue with them learning according to whatever I'm showcasing. So I also want to talk about having um, captioning of some kind. I know um, Graham is using a different tool for this and maybe he can share that with us later, um, but it's live captioning. And I think Zoom is coming out with captioning as well. So that might be um, coming in the near future that you could caption uh, your lecture videos if you're creating them in Zoom. I know YouTube already does that. So if you create um, your videos in YouTube and post them, maybe have a private channel and you post them to your e-class. Um, that might be a good way to do that as well. Or um, you could also upload your lecture notes if you want. And so these are all things that we couldn't do back, you know, in March when we all went online for the first time. It was like so much happening all at one time. And you might not be able to do all these things moving into the fall semester, but these are all things that we can do over time. So to make our teaching and learning environment engaged, we need to ensure it's relational. So how are we engaging with our students? How are students engaging with one another? Obviously our pronouns, um, which Tommy had some really great suggestions for us this morning, inclusive instruction. So even though we're online, are students just looking at a lecture, answering some questions, handing in assignments, doing tests, or are you asking them to be active learners? So is there blogs, is there forums, is there chat, is there video? Um, are you asking the students to collaborate with one another? Are you maybe doing, um, I know that there are some online tools where students can work in groups and almost do a sticky note kind of activity. Um, and I know that I'll look into that here because I, I do want to use that moving forward in some of my workshops because I think it would be a great thing um, to model. Um, and then be present. So whatever you have online, you know, um, and if it's uh, asynchronous and, but you still need to be present. And I'm sure most of you already do this, but uh, you should be responding in blogs and the forums. 
Um, maybe you send out videos or do announcements, you know, every week uh, to keep your students going and motivated. And then providing timely feedback. How long does it take you to hand back your assignments or to respond to students? And, you know, I know it, it's a busy time during the semester and we're managing multiple things all at once, but that timely feedback is really important. Um, there's nothing worse than submitting another assignment before you've had feedback so that you don't know how to improve, right? And so it's like those would be some best or some wise practices. Um, looking at probing questions to spur your conversation. So maybe you'll use student developed questions. Maybe the students work in groups and they come up with questions and then they pose those questions to their student colleagues rather than it just being teacher driven. So what about real world application? So scenarios, stories, case studies, maybe um, you have case studies that showcase different pronoun use. So maybe you have Tommy and she, or Tommy and they, something like that. And then looking at your different activities, which I've already met, mentioned, and then your creative assignments. So do students have the ability to submit videos? Could they create a website? Maybe their website has videos. I've done this in the past with students. Um, this last uh, winter semester when we went online, I too had to go online with the course I was teaching. And those, that was just such a hairy time. But I asked students to please do videos and websites. And they could also do blogs, but I wanted them to at least include a video and they were really well done. Some students did interviews uh, with other educators um, to talk about indigenizing their curriculum. And then you could still do presentations. You could host live presentations on Zoom if you have those dates set out. Um, and those are all ways to bring uh, your community together and to ensure that it's engaged. So I want to talk about uh, racism and I just want to check my time. I'm good. Um, so addressing race and racism in your virtual face-to-face -face classroom. So I have um, this picture that I actually just took when I was uh, on vacation and I was uh, traveling. I was in BC, my family lives in BC and um, I went to go and stay with them. And in Kamloops, uh, we went to the lookout point. Uh, and so, and it looks over the whole valley and you can see um, the river and the lake, um, but this is complete erasure, right? It talks about fur and gold, and there is a, there's a complete elimination of the First Nations of that area. And so, you know, I like to take pictures of all of these things because <laughs> I always find it really interesting um, in places that seem to have good relations with their First Nations, Métis, um, Inuit, or other Indigenous um, peoples of that area, but then there's this complete erasure, right? So uh, I like to analyze and critique these things. So why are these things still happening when we know better, we claim to know better? And I, and I think that, you know, people don't maybe think that it's as important as it is. And so, um, you know, looking at race as a social construct, right? This is something that has been constructed um, and racism and colorblindness. So looking at colorblindness, people will say, oh, I'm colorblind, I don't see color, but that is in fact untrue, right? We all, unless you are actually colorblind, I suppose, um, but we do see color. And that is an erasure of the complexities and the issues that people of color and Black and Indigenous folks uh, face on a daily basis and sometimes a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So how can we uh, incorporate an anti-racist ideology into our curriculum? So we need to incorporate authors from Black, Indigenous, and people of color. We need to, you know, source out like who are our guest speakers? Who are the experts that we're calling on uh, to share their ideas? Those should be people from diverse communities. You can always go to CTL, you can come to me and um, I'll try and help you as best as I can. Um, we have a lot of resources that have been curated and continue to be curated 
on our uh, new website under remote delivery. And if you go there, you'll find uh, EDI. And then EDI gets split off into um, Indigenous and into um, inclusive teaching. And then you can go in there and you can look through the resources and we continue to populate that. And Elena um, is working on that as we speak. Um, you can ask an educational developer. So you can come to myself or any one of my colleagues. Um, but how do we address these racist comments that might come up in the classroom? You can't just let those ideas and those comments stand, right? We, and it, we also don't want to put um, the person of color or the black student or the indigenous student in a position of where they have to address it, right? And so as the authority in the classroom, as the instructor, the professor, that's our job. And so we need to address it. So those are the things that I would call out. And you might do that in a myriad of ways, but it's important that you address it to the class as a whole so that all of the students understand what it means to be uh, in a relationship of reciprocity with one another. How do we want our classroom space to be? Do we want it to be respectful? Do we want it to be a safe space and safe, I put in quotations, because it's um, almost impossible to create a safe situation at all times for everyone, but we need to do our best. So these are the conversations I have with students in the beginning on the very first class. I say these things happen, but they should not happen in this class and these are the reasons why. And we have an open conversation about what we need to do as a learning community to either address those comments when they come through or how do we ensure that they don't happen? And so they might still happen, but I think it's in how you address that. And you can listen to the podcast that uh, Dr. Van Kessel and Ellen Watson and I um, both are all three of us uh, put together. You can just go to our website or you can go to the Teaching Plus podcast and listen to that on your own time. So looking at privilege, so um, I'm the first one to say I have privilege. People look at me and no one says, oh, there's um, an Indigenous woman. I know that, you know, just by the nature of um, my skin tone, I don't represent as an Indigenous person. So people will say things to me that they wouldn't naturally say to someone face to face. So I do hear a lot of the comments, disparaging comments about Indigenous folks, about Indigenous communities. Um, and those are the things that I have to address. I'm, I'm in a position of where I can do that. Um, and I don't mind speaking out against those things. And so we have to use our privilege in those spaces to ensure that we're holding people accountable. And so why is this contentious? People think, oh, I'm white um, and I don't have privilege because I grew up poor. Yes, but you still have privilege because you don't walk into a store and people follow you and think that you're, uh, you're going to steal something. People will naturally move on the sidewalk for you as you walk by, but I have seen firsthand from my family, from my children who look uh, who are way darker. My husband is, is very uh, dark skinned. Um, and what I saw was really kind of interesting of walking with them on a sidewalk in a small Alberta town up north as we were driving to Slave Lake about a year ago. And there were these, uh, you know, two ranchers, uh, male ranchers that were white and they would not get out of the way as my husband was walking by. They were making him move off the sidewalk. And that for me was really sad because this is my husband. This is the person obviously that I love and I'm emotionally connected to, but it made me see things in a way that I don't naturally see because if it was just me walking, they might've actually moved out of the way because I don't represent that way. And so I just feel that it's my duty to call these things out and to say something. And I have to be honest in that moment, I didn't say anything. My husband just grabbed my arm and said, don't say anything. Because he was worried. He was worried for our safety in that situation, right? And so education has a uh, job to do. We need to educate students 
about these facts, about these things that are happening in our society. Right now we have, um, you know, all of these movements happening um, that are bringing light, um, they're bringing to light the things that are happening in our communities. So, um, you know, the death of George Floyd and, and other black people in the United States, the police brutality here in Canada. And we, we saw, you know, one of our chiefs from the North, from, um, from the North, uh, you know, being subjected to that police brutality. And these things are in the news. So we need to actually talk about them. Our students are experiencing these things on visceral levels. And so, we need to connect with them to ensure that they're okay, but we don't need to put this on them to explain to us why these things are happening. That's our job. And so I've talked about the erasure and the restructuring of history. So EDI and course content. So diverse authorship and both who are the experts, but also on content. So it's everything uh, from a heteronormative perspective. What about our course design, implementation and assessment? Is there bias in our assessment? And I, I really, um, I, when I go to mark students' work, I almost don't wanna see who submitted it. I, and not because I feel like I might be biased, but I don't want to be biased. I just wanna look at everything um, as a clean slate and not take into account what students might have done in the past. I wanna look at this as their very best work in that moment. And so I have some resources here, CTL, but Faculty Focus has been putting out some amazing, amazing um, pieces. And any one of you can register. You can just go into Faculty Focus. They have some special reports that they've been creating, which is where um, I got some of my information from. Um, and so those might be of interest to you. But again, I'm going to put a whole document together for, for you to look at a little bit later. So some other ways to create awareness and educate yourself is through the Indigenous Canada MOOC. If you haven't taken that yet, you, you should, it's amazing. Um, this making equity, diversity, inclusion a mission in the classroom is from faculty focused. Looking at Dr. Marie Batiste, Decolonizing Education, uh, Chelsea Vowell, Indigenous Rights gets to the point and she's very, um, she's witty in her writing um, and it's easy for students to read. I always like to pull out Chelsea's work um, and showcase it to students. Chelsea also has um, like a, a really active Twitter feed um, and she talks about a lot of um, things happening in Indigenous communities and the Indigenous Canada relationship. Um, and then I think she also has a blog site too. And she is co-host of Métis in Space, which is a podcast, which is also super great. Um, and then looking at the Peoples of Color online classroom, at a whole slew of resources. Um, my colleague, uh, uh, Tonya Ball, who's a PhD student in Native Studies as well, um, also teaches the Indigenous SLIS course, so for Indigenous libraries, for the Masters of, of Library Studies. And so um, the Indigenous students put together um, a resource page. So that one's super excellent too. And then just some other resources for you to look at. And again, um, these will be available to you a little bit later. Um, so one thing I just want to end on, and I think I'm good for time, um, and this is from Elder uh, Bob Cardinal from Enoch Cree Nation. Um, and he says, the longest journey you'll ever take is from your head to your heart. And I truly believe that. So um, hi, hi. Thank you so much for your time today. Okay, so um, what's a good way to use a forum so that most or all students participate anonymous or not, the forum discussion will not be for marks. When I use the forum, I always make sure that it's for marks. Um, I want the students to um, receive credit in some capacity for um, the content that they're contributing. I always like to make sure that it's for marks, um, but if, if you're not, I think students will naturally disengage in some capacity if it's not for marks, right? They want to do stuff that's for marks, unfortunately. And so maybe we have to get creative in our expectations um, to be like, this is, you know, a cumulative piece of the mark, or this is, um, you know, in some way to increase your knowledge and your understanding. Um, so I don't know if there's one really great way to do that if it's not for marks, but I think it's about 
sharing with the students about why you want them to do this. Why do you want them to do the forum? Is it just because you want to see what they think about a question or their reflection um, on the content, a reflection on what they're learning? Um, and so for some students, that might be okay. But for other students, they might naturally disengage. So I think you're going to have to look at that engagement piece um, for, for the, all of those students. But that would be definitely something that we could work together um, on um, through a consultation. It would be good to look at your syllabus to see what um, exactly is going on so that I can make a better suggestion for you.